Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And what we're going to be talking about in the next uh, 20 minutes, it's uh, the space that, that is the overlapping between science, mostly neuroscience, and architecture. And to, to talk about this, I always uh, mention what we do because it, it may sound like uh, theory or science fiction, but we actually are in the real world doing real projects and designing spaces. And the last uh, few years we have done almost 4 million square meters of interior spaces around the world. Uh, we have offices in, in Mexico and in the United States and throughout Latin America and doing projects almost everywhere in, in the world. So what we're going to be talking about, we, we use it and deliver it in, in real projects and in, in, in real physical environments. It's not just theory. Uh, a few years ago, I started to have kids, and, uh, and my view of the world uh, started to change. I have three kids, and with the first one, I started to, to ask myself, do I like the world that I'm going to inherit to, to my kids? Do I like what we have done as a society? And uh, my answer was no. I don't like many of the things that we have been doing. I don't like the way we have destroyed the world. I don't like that we assume that we have to drug people to help them with uh, mental illnesses. And that's the only solution that we have come up. I don't like uh, the cities that mostly every single city that I know is almost horrible. It's on, uh, with, with certain examples or, or, or uh, specific spaces, we have been really bad doing a lot of things. So uh, I, I started to figure out how can I do, or what can I do to, to change at least what I was doing to, to try to make it better for, for the next generations. And it's how I... Uh, found out about this quote from Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill, like, after the Second World, he needed to rebuild a lot of uh, pieces of architecture uh, in, in London. And one of the things that he needed to rebuild was the House of Commons. But it was the House of Commons. Nobody wanted to spend money in the Commons. So he went to the, to the Congress, and the way he convinced the, the Congress to give them money was uh, explaining that there were, was not only a building what he wanted to do, and that the buildings actually, we designed them, and then they designed us back, they built us back. And uh, interestingly enough, they gave him the money to build the, the House of Commons as we, as we know it today, and he wanted to replace the, the, the space exactly the way it was. And mostly because this idea that he wanted to have a culture uh, the same way that they were able to create before, so he needed a physical space to mold that culture again, to shape that culture. And when I started to try to figure out how I wanted to change the world in, 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 in what I do, uh, I came up uh, really fast to, with, uh, with exponential technologies. And, and I, that's what I, where, where we thought that the changes were, were going to be. And we started to focus on one specific uh, exponential technology, that is neuroscience. What is interesting from neuroscience is that neuroscience as we know it has probably around 20 years. And uh, the most interesting part is that neuroscience has developed knowledge on how your brain works, how memory works, what is perception, how we think, and almost everything related to the brain, equivalent to 2,000 years. So in 20 years, we have generated information and knowledge that is equivalent to 2,000 years. And this information and knowledge, it's, it's really new, very new. I mean, every single day you will find a new research and something new com coming up from, from neuroscience people. But what is, uh, uh, the, what, one of the biggest challenges is that because, of, because it's very new, almost every single industry is not still using that information. And there are industries that are way behind on, on using that information. You can probably see and hear a lot of neuromarketing. So people in marketing, they are already using neuroscience to try to sell you more stuff. 
but you don't hear that many people designing spaces trying to use that knowledge. And I always make a joke that it's, sometimes I feel that I went to school with Jesus Christ, I went to sleep, and 2000, 2,000 years later I wake up and I want to use the same information and knowledge that I had 2,000 years before in my practice. I think that every single industry is going to have to rethink what they do because you, don't, you cannot teach, as we were, we were seeing. Uh, we, you cannot do any single thing that you do the way you used to do it 10, 15 years ago. Almost every single thing that we have been told about the brain is a lie. We have been focusing in what we call as, uh, linear as a research. So basically, it's the, I'm going to talk about a few, and we are not going to have time to, to go deeper in this. Uh, but this idea that, of, of elements I'm going to be talking about, they probably even question the, the meaning of, of design and architecture of built environments. Uh, it's the lines that we have been focusing on, on, on trying to, to understand our embodied cognition awareness of the space, the eyes of the skin, uh, neuroplasticity, and the memory self and the experience itself. I'm going to talk about uh, embodied cognition. That is probably the mother of many of the theories that we are using to, to try to understand this link between physical environments and your brain. But bas basically what embodied cognition means is that there's a lot of research that proves that you don't think just with your brain. The, for example, the, the, the cells that you have in the skin, they have a structure that is very similar to the neurons. And not only they have a structure that is very similar, but they actually process information. Your skin processes information be, before your brain starts to process information. So this idea that your brain is disconnected in the cognitive process from your body and that what is really important is your brain and not, not that much your body, and that the, your body is just um, transport for your brain is, is a mistake. We think with our body and with our brain. And that's called embodied cognition. But there's another theory that is built on top of that one that is probably more interesting even. If you think with your body, you actually think with the things that surround your body. And that's called extended cognition. And I'm going to give a very easy example, but this is one of those things. I mean, I, I remember one telephone from my childhood, and I haven't been remembering any single telephone number since then. I may know my cell phone number, but I don't even know the, my office number. I don't need to. I, I, I think part of my thinking process, part of my pro cognitive process is using this tool, and that has modified the way I think. And this is very obvious because everybody has one and it's very obvious that you probably do a lot of things that you don't have to remember using that technology. But then on the other hand, is that the same thing happens with every single thing that surrounds you. So you don't really just think with your brain, you don't really just think with your body, your body and your brain, but you also think with the elements that surround your body. And that's what I, as I was saying, is extended cognition. You think with the space. So when somebody is designing a space, one of the things that we should be thinking is that probably we are not designing a space. We are designing part of your cognitive process. And this is one of the, 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 the discoveries that starts to question a lot of the things that we have been doing as, as, as designers. There's another one that is very interesting. It's called neuroplasticity. And probably if you are around my age, when you went to school, the teachers told me way too many times that don't go and drink. Because if you go and drink, you're going to kill neurons. And if you keep killing neurons, you're going to end up being really stupid at the end of your life, so don't drink. Well, you can be safe, you can go and have drinks later today, because that's not real. I mean, you may kill neurons, but your brain is constantly creating new neurons and modifying physically every single time. And that's called neuroplasticity. You don't born with a brain the same way that 
you die. The brain is evolving. And what they have researched, they, they have been using little rats in, in a lab, and they have figured out a few elements that impact or modify your brain. So if you take a bunch of rats and you put it in a, what it could be in a cage, that it could be a governmental office, for example. In Mexico, we have plenty of those. Boring, gray. Imagine that you work in, a, in the government and they put you in that little box with no stimuli. And then you, you take another group of, of, of little rats and you put them in what would, could be a Google office with colors and you have a slide and they have fun and they make friends. And four weeks later, you measure the amount of neurons that they both have, the, the, the groups. And the, the, the little rats that were living in the, the cage that looks like Google, they increase the amount of neurons that they have, mostly in the, at the hippocampus. That is in charge of short-term short memory, among other things. You can actually, through the space, change the, the brain of the people. So now imagine that applied to a school where in, in countries like, like Mexico and or many developing countries, the schools are really awful. And it's not a priority to do a school that has a stimuli because you probably have very little budget and, and the, the people in charge of doing the school, they don't even understand the importance of this. So you have kids that what you are actually doing is modifying their brain to have less neurons where you need them to have neurons. So this is, this is really huge when you come to, to, to certain uh, specific type of spaces, when you are doing corporate or when you are doing educational spaces. And, uh, and how we do take this into, into a practice, and I think that's probably the biggest challenge, because information and, and, uh, and knowledge on, on new research is, is abundant. Every single day, as I was mentioning, you can get, in, I get an, at least 10 emails from different research departments on universities with one single discovery, at least 10 every day. So one of the biggest challenges is that how, how, what do you do with that information and how to, do you transform that into something that, that can modify people's life in, in the real world? The first part is that we probably have to stop, stop thinking about built environments the way we have been thinking about built environments. We have been thinking that the, the impact and the power of a, of a built environment is just to contain people. If you have a good luck and a budget, you may hire an architect that is going to convince you that has to be beautiful. And if you are lucky enough, you're going to have a space that is beautiful and functional. But that doesn't, that doesn't cut it. That's not enough. There's a lot of layers of, of deepness and complexity that just doing beautiful things is not enough. And with beautiful things, there, there's another biggest challenge. There's we have to distinguish between aesthetics and beauty. And I'm not going to go deeper on, on beauty. If I'm going to be around if somebody wants to talk about it. But I'm just going to explain to you quickly what happens with, with neuroscience and, and aesthetics. Beauty is a construct, a social construct. So it may be different for each one of us. Aesthetics is not. Aesthetic is built in our brain. Normally, beauty builds works around aesthetics, but they are not the same thing. When we're talking about aesthetics, one of the most amazing things is where it happens. In your brain, where it happens when you see something that you don't like. And it happens at the, the cortex isular. The cortex isular is the part of the brain in charge of pain. Ugly things hurt. They're painful. To your brain. You may not notice it. It doesn't physically hurt. But your brain doesn't distinguish when it hurts the difference between physical pain and mental pain. So next time you go around or you are standing in an ugly space, think how much that could be hurting you and, and, and how much pain could you be suffering because of that. What is interesting is the, the brain once that gets the pain, it sends a message to the matrix part of the brain. So telling you to move. So basically what you have to do when something is hurting you, you move. And then try to understand 
why you have kids in many schools they are fucking ugly and then you ask you, you want the kid to be sitting sitting still for six hours but the message the message that the space is telling them is this is not good for you move so probably we could start rethinking deficit disorder for example with kids and start to think that maybe we are the, one of the reasons why the kid doesn't want to be still. We are telling them to move because this is ugly. So instead of just assuming that the only solution for deficit disorder or depression, for example, is to go and drug kids or adults, we could start rethinking what we have been doing, building the world, the, the world that we know, and then we will probably see that we, have, we are co-responsible of many of the things that are happening with these kids. Oh, sorry. Mm. Well, they, there it is. What is this one? What we have been doing is there's a neuroscience lab in Canada that developed this, this wearable. And the idea of the wearable is that it can measure your brain. So basically what you're hearing is the representation of, of somebody's meditating. And the idea is that when you meditate, the, this, this wearable starts to measure different uh, waves. One of the waves is the alpha wave. There's a lot of research that proves that the, when you go into the flow, well, this, this part of where, where you don't focus on what is surrounding you, when you see an artist creating a painter painting or a surfer in the wave, uh, taking the waves amazingly, all those amazing people that are doing something incredible that they don't even connect with the, with the, with the things that are surrounding. They are completely in the zone if you are uh, in sports. Uh, that's, that's something that happens in your brain. And we have been measuring, and there's a lot of research that proves that there's a gap on the alpha waves, that if the alpha waves are on that gap, that thing happens. Uh, a lot of things happen in your brain when you are getting into that. Your, your cortex, uh, the frontal cortex disconnects. You stop having worries. You just focus on what you're doing. But the interesting thing is that certain things that we can measure allow you to be there. And what the research that we're doing right now is to, to use this technology to try to understand if I can modify the physical environment to help you be in that place. Because if I, if I don't do it right, the alpha waves can get you to sleep if there are not much movement, or they can give you anxiety if you have way too many. So we could start treating, for example, anxiety with physical environments. And the research that we're doing right now is trying to link how and what elements are actually impacting the, the, the different waves and mental states. And I go back to Winston Churchill. My, my answer today that why the buildings that we shape, they shape us back, is because they are not buildings. We are not shaping buildings. We are a space. So it's, it's not something independent from us that we're shaping, that is shaping us back. It's what we are really doing is an extension of, of you, of yourself. The space is going to become an extension of your cognitive process that is probably one of the most intimate things that we have. So when we are designing spaces, we are not designing spaces. We are getting into more, one of the most intimate things you have, and we're going to modify that. Well, the last thoughts is that we really are not designers. We are human hackers. And, and this is probably uh, something very new for, for our industry, for, for architects, to stop thinking about objects that are just going to help people to live in and, and, and use them, and to start thinking that that object is actually part of your brain. What we're doing with that object is that we're hacking your brain. We can do that 
in a good way and help you be happier, more productive, and, and, and without stress and live better, or we can keep doing what we have been doing that is basically not knowing anything about how to hack your brain, but doing it anyway. Thank you very much.